Hello, everyone, and welcome to the launch of the 2022 Global Terrorism Index. My name is Melissa Lepis, and I'm the Chief of Strategy at the Global Center on Cooperative Security. We are delighted to co-host today's event together with the Institute of Economics and Peace, the authors of the 2022 GTI, the Resolve Network at the U.S. Institute of Peace, and in collaboration with the Global Research Network at the United Nations Counterterrorism Committee Executive Directorate. At the Global Center, our mission is to achieve lasting security by advancing inclusive human rights-based policies, partnerships, and practices that address the root causes of violent extremism. We know that evidence-based and data-driven approaches to countering terrorism and preventing violent extremism are imperative to stemming the tide of this ever-evolving threat and can protect against the misuse and abuse of counterterrorism regimes by avoiding sensationalizing and exceptionalizing the threat. We turn to the GTI as a leading reference for tracking terrorism trends, statistics, and global level analysis. The GTI's findings are particularly relevant this year, as we have witnessed how the circumstances and responses brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic influence various forms of political contention, conflict, and resource scarcity across the globe. In its ninth iteration, the report uses data to analyze the impact of terrorism and its trends at both the national and global level. It provides insights which help to inform critical debates on the future of terrorism, as well as relevant policy responses addressing recent developments and trends. Here in New York, we know it's a document that is often referred to in our discussions with the UN community. The report substantiates several key findings and includes a focus on terrorism in the Sahel, the terrorism and conflict cycle, right-wing violent extremism in the West, and the implications of COVID-19. The GTI 2022 report also analyzes a number of vital aspects of terrorism, such as the socioeconomic conditions under which it occurs, how terrorism and the terrorist groups evolve over time, as well as the geopolitical drivers, ideological aims, and strategies used by these groups. The report's launch coincided with the invasion of the Ukraine by Russia and the unprecedented responses from countries around the world. The impacts of this war on the world order cannot be understated. Indeed, Ukraine has become the front line in a struggle, not just between democracies and autocracies, but in a struggle for maintaining a rules-based system. As regards our discussion here today, thousands of foreign fighters, including right-wing extremists, have mobilized in the Ukraine over the years. How this crisis will unfold and its broader impacts on peace and security are yet to be seen, including in relation to the further mobilization of foreign fighters. To walk us through the report's key findings, we are pleased to have Steve Kilalea, founder and executive chairman of IEP, here with us today. Following his presentation, reflections will be shared by Farah Kassim, Political Affairs Officer at CTED, and Alistair Reed, Executive Director at the Resolve Network. Before I turn the floor over to Steve, please allow me to share a few housekeeping notes. We hope to provide ample time for what we expect to be a rich Q&A. We invite you to raise your hand to deliver questions on camera, or alternatively, to submit your questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We will do our best to address as many of them as possible. The event is being recorded. The link of the recording will be made available again after our event. We welcome your social media engagement. Please follow any of the participating organizations of today's event to learn more about the GTI and our respective work. It is now my pleasure to hand it over to Steve to walk us through this report's key findings. Thank you for the introduction, Melissa, and that's very good. So this is going to be a very fast moving presentation. So I'm just in the process now of, scare, of sharing my screen. Uh, now, can everyone see that? Stay, I'm gonna have to stop and start again. Got the wrong one. That's the splash board rather than the, uh, presentation. So let's try it this time. Can everyone see that? 
Okay, great. Well, we're away. First off, I'll start off with just a little bit of background on the Institute for Economics and Peace. It was set up to understand the intersection between business, peace and economics, place special emphasis on metrics to measure peace, and then to ascribe an economic value to changes in peace. It's located in a, uh, five different, six different offices around the world, Sydney, New York, Brussels, Den Haag in the Netherlands, Mexico City, and Harare in Zimbabwe. The work's used by most of the, or by all the international uh, organisations. We do a lot of contract research for people like the World, World Bank, uh, Commonwealth Secretariat, uh, uh, United Nations, OECD, and many, many more. The work's now included in thousands of university courses around the world. And we get over 20, uh, well, last year anyway, we had over 28 billion uh, yeah, yeah, media and social media impressions back from the launch of this year's uh, Global Terrorism Index, which was really difficult for coverage because of the uh, situation in the Ukraine. In the first 10 hours, we were up to 2.5 billion media impressions from about 1,200 different articles. So it'll peel on from there. This is a quick list of our products. I'm not going to go through them all, but it'll give you an idea, and this is not all of it, it's only some, but it gives you an idea of the depth. So today's is exclusively focused on the Global Terrorism Index. Now, without more to do, let's get into the real presentation now that the advertising's over. So this is the eighth year of the uh, Global Terrorism Index. It covers 163 countries, which is about 99.7% of the world's population. And it measures the index, and it uses relative ways of being able to measure, measure terrorism. Uh, now, this index really just creates one indicator which goes into the Global Peace Index. So this will give you an idea of just the sophistication which lies behind the Global Peace Index, which is our leading work. Now, let's just have a quick look at the methodology. So we use Terrorism Tracker from a company called G Dragonfly. We've got incidents, injuries, deaths, and hostages, which we use to actually create the score, different weights based on each. Now, then what we do is we use a smoothing mechanism over five years, and that's to account for the emotional legacy which comes from terrorism, because as we all know, there's an emotional impact which hangs around for years within society. So we then take that, divide it with a lot of socioeconomic indicators and data to get a more fuller picture on the drivers and what are the conditions which surround terrorism. And so that's basically the index in a nutshell. So let's now start to move into the results. So we'll just hit the key highlights. This is a, 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 a heat map of where the various attacks have, hurt, have happened in the last 12 months. And we'll see that sort of there's a number of hot spots. The first is the Sahil, which I'll come more to later. We can also see it in the Middle East, Syria, or Iraq. Then we can move over to a, uh, South Asia, uh, uh, and, the, uh, and then we can move over into the, the Asia Pacific, particularly around the Philippines as well. And note that Myanmar is now really quite high in this as well. So now if we look at it, uh, what's interesting, deaths from terrorism actually did decreased 1.2%. But if we look at it, it's really stayed flat the last four years. And so the number of people who have been killed by terrorism in the last four years have moved in a range of 7,100 to 7,300. However, the number of attacks were up by 17%. Therefore, what we can see is the attacks are getting less lethal. And that would point to a, a decaying uh, sophistication within uh, terrorism globally, uh, because obviously the more a, uh, yeah, effective they are, the more people are killed per attack. Now, one of the really good pieces of news, 86 countries improved this year compared to 19 that deteriorated. But note the difference between the number of deaths, just down by 1.2%. Now, what we've found in the explanation for that is that terrorism is becoming more concentrated into conflict zones. So 97% of all people killed by terrorism actually occurred in conflict zones. And if we look at the 10 countries most affected by terrorism, they're all conflict zones. And now if we went back to 2017, 
what we would have found, that would have been 92% of all deaths were in the uh, conflict zones then. So we can see that it's, a, that it's actually becoming more contracted. Now, when you get into a conflict zone, terrorism deaths are six times more deadly than elsewhere in the world. Now, the Sahel's now the epicenter of terrorism. Deaths up there are 10 times since 2007, and 43% of all deaths through terrorism in 2021 occurred in the Sahel. Now, if we look at Sub-Saharan Africa, and obviously Sahel is part of Sub-Saharan Africa, deaths there decreased by 10%. So now, if we look at it, 48% uh, uh, of all deaths globally occurred in Sub-Saharan Africa. So we can see that the, ma the vast majority of them are actually happening in the Sahel. Now, the reason for the decrease in uh, deaths in Sub-Saharan Africa really was Boko Haram. Deaths in that organisation fell by 92%, uh, but it's still quite lethal. I think it's 178 odd people killed. Now, part of the good news is deaths in the uh, Middle East and North Africa continue to climb down 14%. In fact, all other than one country in the Mamina actually improved their score, but still a substantial number of people getting killed, 1,100. So Islamic State, and along with its affiliates, are now the most deadly group in the world. They killed over 2,000 people, and that was in 20 different countries globally. And JNIM is the fastest uh, growing group globally. They're situated in the Sahel. They increased their death rate by 69% to 353 deaths. Islamic State of West Africa, again, in the Sahel, is the most lethal group group in the world. And in Nigeria, they launched 23 attacks, but each attack on average killed 15 people. Like, truly, truly shocking. Now, one of the other things which I think is of interest, we find that 52% of all attacks aren't ascribed to any particular terrorist group. And quite pleasingly, attacks in the West have fallen substantially. Uh, there were only 59 attacks in 2021. That's down 70% over the last four years, or three years, really. Uh, and so the West, that consists of Europe, US, uh, Canada, Australia, uh, yeah, New Zealand, countries such as that. But now, surprisingly, which none of us would have thought five years ago, politically motivated terrorism has overtaken religious terrorism. In fact, five times more attacks have been politically motivated than militic than the uh, religiously motivated in the last five years. And Myanmar has had the largest increase in terrorism, rising 20 times. We've got over 500 deaths from terrorism in Myanmar now, and that's on the back of the coup, and that says something which may make us ponder on the Ukraine, but more of that later. Mozambique uh, recorded the largest improvement. Uh, the, uh, uh, the death rate there was down 82%, or well, that was a, and that was 90, yeah, so down to 90 deaths, so still pretty high. Now, this is the uh, map of the countries most affected by uh, uh, terrorism. I'm not going to go through each of them in detail, but as you can see, and I mentioned earlier on, all of them are in conflict. So the only new country in this list is Myanmar, uh, which is now coming in at number nine. And we'd expect the uh, 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 terrorism in Myanmar to continue, if not increase, over the next couple of years as civil insurgency uh, picks up. Now, this just gives you an idea of the different countries and uh, just the changes in over year, over time. What I'd like to do is bring you to the bottom graph, which is the uh, uh, ones from all other countries. So if we note, in uh, 2020, there were 4,000. If we look in 2021, that's down to 3,200. So that's a drop of about 20%. So again, it's coming back and showing that the deaths are getting more concentrated into the countries with the highest levels of terrorism. And here, if we have a look at this, we find that the uh, 86% of all deaths happen in, a, uh, happen in a, uh, uh, the 10 countries most affected 
by terrorism. And again, you see this massive slant. We'll come to more of that later on. You'll note Afghanistan, 20% uh, of deaths in Afghanistan. Now that the Taliban's the government, uh, uh, that will change dramatically, we imagine, in 2022. So the terrorist group, which would be the one to watch there, uh, the Islamic State's affiliate, Koshoshan chapter, now they're in the middle of winter at the moment, and we know that's not the fighting season. So we'd need to wait to spring to see whether that organisation gets how active it becomes and how effective it is in being able to target the Taliban, which will make so it'll be a very, very different picture next year on terrorism in Afghanistan. Now, these are the major deteriorations. So I mentioned the uh, uh, yeah, first one's the uh, Myanmar. Now, the second one is Niger and Mali. Both of them uh, reside in the Sahel. And in fact, if you look at that, three of the 10 countries with the worst changes all reside in the Sahel. Now, if we look at the improvements, again, we're back to Mozambique, Nigeria, and that's entirely due to the fall in death rates with Boko Haram. Then obviously Syria's improved, followed by Chad, Colombia, and Somalia. Now let's have a look at a few of the trends, and I really find this quite some of these graphs quite fascinating. So if we look at this, this takes the various countries and just shows the change out since 2007. And so there's a number of things here which are really quite interesting. So if we look at the yellow block in the center, that's Iraq. Look at the changes in that since 2016. Now, if we look at the Sahel and we go back to 2008, that's the uh, green bar. You'll find it's almost non-existent. And then what we can find then over time, increasing out to what we can see today. Now, the other one is the orange bar, which is all other countries. What I want you to notice, that hasn't really changed much since 2007, which in some ways means if we got rid of all the major conflicts, we'd still be left with this underlying great terrorism. At least that's the hypothesis anyway. So come back here. This gives you an idea of the major terrorist groups and how they've changed over time. And again, sort of we can uh, see again all uh, the Islamic State. Uh, Islamic State's the grey one, which is the second bar down. We can see how that's arrived. And what we can see after they lost their ground in the, uh, Syria and Iraq, uh, what they've done is a lot of the fight has shifted to other parts of the world, including in particular Africa and the Sahel. And again, if we look at the brown graph, that's unknown. So again, we can see that Islamic State is now the most deadly terrorist group in the world. And now this gives you an idea of the changes over time. And so if we look at Middle East, and we went out to 2016, that was the deadliest region in the world. Now we can see what's happened over time, that's changed. And now we can see that Sub-Saharan Africa, at least measured by deaths, is the most deadly area of the world. Now, terrorism, it's shifting. It really has quite changed. And I, this is a graph I really, really do like. So if we, well, maybe not like, but look, this looks at a uh, Islamic State and its various uh, 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 chapters and looks at the changes in the, in the, uh, the over time in the way in, in where, where it's all been occurring. And so if we come back and we look at it, <coughs> look at it we can see the grey part is the Islamic State, and we can see now if we look over to the Croatian chapter, we can see how it's risen since 2017. And similarly, we can see Islamic State in West Africa, the way it's been improving since about, or increasing since about 2015. So it gives an idea of just the changes over time. Now, this is an interesting graph. There's a number of people, a number of countries which suffered at least one death. No, the numbers have been increasing every year uh, uh, for quite a long while, up until 2021. So we had 20 countries where Islamic State was able to uh, murder someone. That's down by six countries from 2020. We look at the regional distribution too. And so what we can see is the big blue on it was MENA. We go over and we look at the red of the uh, yellow, that's sub-Saharan Africa. So we can see just how radical that change has been. 
So let's now, seeing we've been talking about the Sahel, have a quick look at Sahel. This will give you an idea of the change in incidence over time and deaths over time. And obviously a big spike in 2015, that was Boko Haram, fell off the next year, but it's just been increasing every year since 2016. Kidnappings. Now, that's this is one of the things which has taken off from nothing. So a lot of the time the kidnappings are done to provide revenue for a lot of the militias within the, uh, uh, Africa. So we're now up over to uh, 900 kidnappings in 2021. And so that's that, like we look at that graph and that keeps going. That's just mind blowing. Now, one of the things which we notice when we hit the Sahil, it's got some of the worst ecological degradation in the world. And one of the things we find is within this is stuff which comes out of an ecological threat to, uh, report. So if we look at the countries which are most impacted by ecological degradation, most of them are in conflict. So you've got this vicious cycle going on. And so if we move to the, uh, 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 the Sahil, there's a whole series of systemic problems. So you've got very, very weak governments. And what we find is that terrorism most of the terrorist deaths and attacks are occurring along the borders of countries because it's a lot harder for the governments to reach from their central authority out into the, the outreaches of their country. So that's where it's most lawless. So there's a lack of water, a lack of which leads to a lack of food, uh, which means that a lot of people are desperate. 80% of the Sahil uh, would, be food, would be suffering from food insecurity just to drive it home. Over and above that, on top of that, uh, you've also got some of the highest population growths in the world. In fact, Niger, population growth there is expected to increase by 161% over the next 30 years. And so the population in this area, which is already overpopulated, will probably increase by more than 30% in the oh, sorry, more than 90% in the next 30 years. And that like, and so this really needs addressing if we need to want to have address the underlying roots of terrorism there. So now let's move into something which is probably a little bit more positive. I love this graph. So if we look at it, and it's contrary to where we thought we were going to be four years ago. So if we look at the number of deaths from, if we look at the number of attacks, it's been decreasing now for the last three years, quite substantial. This corresponds with COVID. What we find is there's a real change in the spread of the various uh, 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 attacks as well. So we can find that the far left, which is the orange graph at the top, is the most prevalent. And we can see that the far right has almost fallen away to non-existent. And religious attacks we find now five times less frequent over the last five years than politically motivated attacks. Now. Why has this been decreasing? We don't fully know. One of it was probably better a, a counter-terrorism mechanism in the West so they can actually pick people earlier. But what we find is most people, all the people doing a, a terrorism in the West in the last few years aren't affiliated with a group. We do find now that a, a, a far left attacks are far more common than far right. But over time, the far far right have been far, far more deadly. So now, but if we look at it over time, we come back and we find that uh, religious uh, terrorism has been by far the most deadly, followed by the far right, and then the unclear separatists, and then finally far left. So now, as I mentioned, politically motivated terrorism is now, as the uh, attacks are five times higher over the last five years. So in 2021, there were only three Islamist attacks in Europe. That resulted in two deaths. In the US, there were only seven attacks, but none of them were tied to any group. They were all individuals who were ascribing to some sort of ideology. And there's a lot of similarities we're starting to find between far left, far right. For example, they both like to attack government targets with 17% of their attacks. Although <coughs> the ideologies they ascribe to, a lot of their motivations are similar. A lot of it's alienation from the system, disenchantment with the system, 
a, a disbelief in politics, a belief in conspiracy theories and a whole range of other similar motivations. And when we look in the West, we find that terrorism's higher when you've got politically motiv motivated terror, that's up. Also access to weapons, which doesn't come as being anything surprising. And also with militarization's high, but also it's associated with uh, higher levels of social inequity as well. So they seem to be as parts of the driving mix about terrorism in the West. All right, let's have a look at terrorism and conflict now. What we find is that when you're looking at 80% uh, of all terrorist attacks happen within 50 kilometers of a conflict zone. So again, it's driving home that link between terrorism and conflict. These are the major terrorist uh, groups in the world. I'm not gonna go through the detail of this because it would take forever. It would take a long while anyway, maybe not forever. Uh, but I would refer you to it in the report, so it makes, a, makes for interesting reading. Now, this I find it fascinating. So if we look at terrorist groups and how long they stay active for, 50% of them cease to exist within the first three years. However, once they get over about seven years in existence, it's very, very hard to get, the, get rid of them. And what this says really quite clearly is there's a need when new terrorist groups arrive to really focus on them uh, very clearly in the first couple of years in their existence because that's when they're weakest. Once they get after seven years, they're usually embedded into a local community, have a lot of support, and it's very, very hard to actually unstick them. Let's go back and have a look a little at the Ukraine, seeing that's a topic at the moment. And we put out a small ancillary report on the Ukraine uh, with this release. Originally, that wasn't there, but when we saw the war in the Ukraine start, well, we thought we'd better put something out which gives some background and some insight. So what we did is we went back and we looked at the Ukraine in 2014, Georgia in 2008, and terrorism kicked off both those times. So Ukraine suffered 78 attacks in that period and Georgia 41 attacks. And as we know, as the intensity of the conflict increases, so does the level of terrorism with it. And so we expect in the current war in the Ukraine, which is much more intense than what preceded it, we're going to see terrorism actually increase here as well. And so if Russia's successful, it takes over Kiev, let's say, and puts in a puppet government, then there's going to be a strong civil resistance movement against the government, very similar to what you're seeing in Myanmar. Uh, Russians may respond by then a, 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 a funding a whole lot of right-wing militias, and then that is the breeding ground for very high levels of terrorism. But obviously that hasn't happened as yet, uh, and certainly we hope that it doesn't happen. Now, cyber attacks, and this is one of the things which is really new about this war. So if we went back in the lead up, and these are phenomenal stats, but if we went back up in the lead up, there were 397 uh, cyber attacks in the Ukraine in 2020. 285,000 in the first 10 months. And we can see that uh, that's the uh, actually, uh, we can see just in the lead up to the war, a number of attacks happening then, uh, particularly if one's sort of plastering websites with Ukrainians, you need to be afraid, uh, you don't know what's coming and other such thing. Now, what we've got new in this war, which we've never seen before, is we've actually now got a real cyber war because we've seen Anonymous come out and say that they've declared cyber war on the Ukraine. We've seen the Ukrainian government come out and look for a, a global network of volunteers to wage cyber war on Russia. And we're starting to see it being effective, okay? We're seeing it coming up on mobile phones. We're seeing a, 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 a things coming up on parking meters. A, 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 a President Putin's yacht got uh, taken over and uh, it was made to look like it had crashed and with a big sign going up uh, on it about where it was going was the journey to hell. The Kremlin's website's been taken out and we have seen in the last uh, couple of days, Russia say that if it's a, a, a satellites are attacked through cyber attacks, they'll see that as an act of war. And so that 
brings in serious consideration about the, uh, the likelihood of the uh, uh, spillover effects for for a uh, spillover effects into NATO. What happens if NATO is attacked uh, uh, by uh, uh, Russia in response? Or cyber attacks in response to the cyber attacks, it's getting it gets very very messy. The, the meta, we need a lot better definitions for what creates cyber attacks, cyber warfare, and cyber terrorism. One of the other things with cyber attacks too, which we've seen from the Ukraine, they spill over into other other jurisdictions as well. So attacks in Latvia and Lithuania spell over into the Bundesberg in Germany, where seven uh, parliamentarians had their uh, Ghost Rider a, uh, virus having their emails hacked, and that spilled over. I think twenty six different people in state in state parliaments as well. We saw another attack in the Ukraine spill over. That was uh, attacking uh, people's uh, uh, tax payments spill over, spill over into the U.S. Uh, that caused one billion dollars worth of estimated losses, and then the U.S. Uh, 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 to charge six Russians with their responsibility. That, my friends, is the end of one very, very fast-moving presentation. And now I'll uh, uh, pass it back to our host. Back to you, Melissa. Thank you so much, Steve, for this very comprehensive presentation. Uh, we have a few questions that are coming in, and we'll, we'll turn to those nearer to the end, um, just to have a, a bit more information on how some of the data is derived. Um, but uh, I think I will next pass it over to Farah Kassim to share her analysis. Farah, the floor is yours. Thank you, um, dear colleagues and friends. It's my pleasure to participate in today's event marking the launch of the 2022 Global Terrorism Index. Uh, first, I'd like to thank our partners, the Global Center on Cooperative Security, the Institute of Economics and Peace, the United States Institute of Peace, and the Resolve Network for organizing this event. Each year, we, we eagerly await the launch of the annual GTI, and this year's no exception. For CTED integrating empirical research, such as the counterterrorism, uh, the Global Terrorism Index, sorry, into our analysis work has been an essential part of our mandate, which was recently reiterated in Security Council Resolution 2617, adopted in December of last year. Dear colleagues and friends, um, Without a doubt, terrorism and violent extremism conducive to terrorism remain a global concern and they remain high on the Security Council, uh, the Council's agenda. And when reflecting on the latest GTI and the work of the Council's Counterterrorism Committee and its Executive Directorate, three priority areas stand out and they're very similar to um, some of the priorities that Steve has already mentioned. They're the COVID-19 pandemic and its impacts on terrorism and counterterrorism, ISIL in Africa, and terrorism on the basis of xenophobia, racism, and intolerance, which also falls under um, politically motivated terrorism in the GTI. So first on the pandemic, when COVID-19 was declared a global pandemic, it was impossible for any of us to imagine its potential scale or intensity. Over two years into this crisis, its impact on all aspects of our lives are very clear. And it has also impacted the geopolitical landscape and almost every major global policy field, including counterterrorism and countering violent extremism. During this time, CTED conducted semi-annual analyses of the impacts of the pandemic on terrorism and counterterrorism. And these, uh, this analysis, these analyses can be found on our website. Um, our analysis uh, throughout the report suggests that thus far, the pandemic has exacerbated existing trends rather than creating new ones. Although terrorist groups have sought to exploit pandemic related anxieties, we should be cautious about attributing variances in terrorist activity solely to the pandemic. However, pandemic related social restrictions necessary for a robust public health response have in some instances led to human rights violations. And in several regions, the pandemic has worsened poverty, unemployment, and inequalities. The evidence is clear that these types of grievances can fuel radicalization to terrorism. It also clearly shows that terrorists and violent extremists will seek to exploit those grievances both online and offline. Our counterterrorism and CVE responses have also been negatively impacted. Civil society organizations have faced funding cuts, uh, reducing their programs and operations. School closures have restricted access to education for children, 
and youth have seen curtailed employment opportunities. With member states rightly prioritizing public health and their economies, uh, any reallocation of counterterrorism resources risks weakening preparedness and capacity, especially in states requir requiring such assistance. Second, um, the growing threat posed by ISIL in Africa. Since suffering significant tactical and territorial losses in Iraq and Syria, ISIL is giving greater emphasis to its activities in Africa. It has established branches across the continent, expanding into areas already troubled by conflict and other areas previously unscathed by terrorist violence. These groups have shown their ability to launch deadly and coordinated attacks, capture strategic territories and recruit followers. The frequency of ISIL attacks and the resulting casualties across the continent indicate that African states are facing an unprecedented terrorist threat that is compounding and wor the worsening humanitarian situation on the ground. Um, in the coming months, the Counterterrorism Committee and the 1267-1989-2253 ISIL Daesh and Al Qaeda Sanctions Committee will be holding a joint open briefing on ISIL in Africa, and this will shed considerable insight on those developments. Uh, the third issue is the increased threat by, by those motivated by xenophobia, racism, and intolerance. During our assessment visits, CTED has heard growing concerns from many member states on the evolving threat from those actors. Drawing on the engagement with member states and CTED's global research network partners, CTED published two trends alerts on the topic, one on the transnational threat of what we were calling at the time extreme right-wing terrorism, and another on how these actors are co-opting the pandemic. These publications, which drew on CTC country assessments and inputs from the Global Research Network and other partners, provide an analysis of emerging trends, gaps, and challenges associated with this growing pheno phenomenon. Our analysis suggests that those actors are increasingly operating transnationally, including in financial and operational areas, and exploiting the internet for radicalization and recruitment. These actors have also sought to co-opt the pandemic um, to propagate baseless conspiracy theories and incite violence and attacks. And we continue to monitor this trend closely. Lastly, I would like to note that Afghanistan is once again an area of concern for us. Um, we are deeply concerned at the potential for Afghanistan to once again become a safe haven for terrorist groups such as Al-Qaeda or ISIL Khorasan. So uh, with this, we must not lose sight of the key principles that must remain at the core of all our counterterrorism efforts. Firstly, we must ensure that all our policies and programs are evidence-based, gender responsive, age sensitive, and human rights compliant. Secondly, we must ensure a whole of society approach in our efforts to counterterrorism, its financing, and the spread of online extremist content. Thirdly, we must ensure that partners such as civil society organizations the financial sector and the private sector are increasingly included in all our efforts. And lastly, we must recognize that terrorist activities often transcend jurisdictions and borders, including digital borders. In that we must continue our efforts to strengthen national, regional and international cooperation across sectors and must therefore, and that should remain a, a priority. Thank you. Thank you very much, Farah, and thank you for uh, drawing us attention to the consequences of the evolving situation in Afghanistan with the, the, with the military withdrawal there. Um, we'll be keen to, to circle back to Steve to hear a little bit more about how the data that we're seeing in the report reflects um, the Taliban as, as the current government. Um, but before we do that, I would like to welcome Alistair Reid to take the floor. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say um, thank you very much to our, to our hosts, um, the Global Centre, for hosting this event, and also um, to um, the Institute of um, Economics and Peace for putting together this excellent um, report, and for um, Steve for his great presentation, and Farah for a good analysis. Um, I always look forward to the GTI coming out every year, and um, it's um, it's an incredibly important document, um, you know, and I know that it's well, well, well used by terrorism scholars and by um, policymakers alike. You know, to be able to actually tackle terrorism, we need to be able to properly understand it, and that means we need to carry out empirical research on it. And in this, um, a research area which has historically lacked um, 
real data, the GTI makes a real contribution to it. Now, I just want to make um, three um, brief um, sort of reflections before we move on to our discussion. Um, the first reflection I want to make was about if we take a step back and, and look underneath the num numbers of GTI, actually how terrorism manifests itself around the world, there actually is quite a lot of variety in, in how, this, um, how it manifests itself. Um, and the first point, if we look at the difference between conflict zones and non-conflict zones, um, as Steve highlighted, you know, um, it's increasingly that terrorism is taking place in, in conflict zones, with like 97% of um, terrorist um, attacks are taking place in countries suffering from violent conflict. But it'd be worthwhile for remembering those of us sitting in the West that actually how the West experiences terrorists and normally in the country um, situations not at war is actually extremely different to how Ter uh, terrorism is experienced by the vast majority of the rest of the world. Our terrorism impacts in a, in a war zone is very different to the country at peace. And this difference between um, the West and the rest of the world is also highlighted um, later on in the report where we look at the different factors which correlate with terrorism and the factors which correlate for the country as part of the OCD, the rest of the world. Um, there are some overlap, but also some significant differences. The second um, um, that I wanted to flag was the variation in targets, whereas in some countries, the primary target is the military, notably in um, Syria and Iraq. And in Syria, we see ISIS increasingly shifting away from civilians to military personnel, where 79% of the casualties are, are military. But if we then to look at um, other countries, which are in the top 10 um, countries suffering from terrorism this year, such as Burkina Faso, it's um, the opposite way around, where um, the vast majority are civilian casualties. In Burkina Faso, 65% are civilians, and similarly in Niger, it's 78% are civilians. So it's different in, in casualties how it manifests on the ground. But also just an interesting thing that came out in this report, um, and I'm not sure, um, Steve may be able to correct me on this later on, but about the number of terrorist incidents which are not actually uh, prescribed to a particular group. So overall, 52% of um, terrorist incidents are not claimed by a particular group around the world. I'm not sure whether that's an increasing trend since 2007, so I'd be interested to know from Stephen that. But when, but when you look at the different regions around the world, this actually varies quite a lot. Whereas in, in Europe, only 18% of, um, of tax are claimed. So that's 82% of tax are not claimed. Whereas in MENA in South Asia, it's about half the tax are claimed. But then in South America, only 2% of the tax are not claimed. And then the second reflection I want to make is um, reflecting on terrorism in Sahel. Um, as Steve pointed out, this has been one of the big trains from 2007, the rise of terrorism in Sahel, where it's now becoming the deadliest region and um, accounting for about a third of terrorist attacks. But there's another point which um, the GTI report highlights. So that due to the pervasive insecurity across much of the Sahel, we often have a situation where local communities are coming together to form localized um, militias, which are adding to the cycle of violence. Now, this is an area that Resolve has been doing much research on in the last few years. And we've carried out numerous field research across Sub-Saharan Africa looking at what we call community-based armed groups or sea bags. These are community-based armed groups which have come together in the face of terrorism or violent extremism, sometimes with the support of state and sometimes without. And through our research, we've seen how these groups sometimes can play a positive role providing security and um, encountering the groups, but they can also provide a negative role and often become the drivers of violence. But one of the important aspects of looking at um, community-based armed groups is that when we research terrorism and extremism, we often look at the groups in isolation. But actually, terrorist groups are only part of a much wider ecosystem of violence. It's not just the state and the terrorist groups. There's multiple other non-state actors or quasi-non-state actors involved in that dynamics, such as community-based armed groups. And to be able to properly understand the dynamics of violence happening, we need to be able to map out these wider ecosystems with all the different actors in it. And we need to take a holistic approach to understand these wider ecosystems of violence to be able to tailor responses to the situation. And then 
the final um, reflection I wanted to raise is about the relationship between terrorism and fragility. Again, we're looking at the situation in, um, in the Sahel and across sub-Saharan Africa. We see often um, fragility can often be a driver of terrorism. Federal states often provide the context and the structural factors that can either drive violent extremism or create spaces in which they can emerge. Whether this is political instability, which is particularly important recently um, given the number of coups in the region, or through weak governance and corruption, but also across um, the wider impacts of environmental change, creating competition for limited resources. But fragility also creates opportunities for um, by extremists and terrorists to exploit, whether this is through providing security and justice for local communities where the state aren't able to provide these, but also through taking sides in intercommunal ethnic conflicts and leveraging these um, conflicts for their own support and recruitment. But finally, also terrorism and where it's successful ultimately undermines and destroys the state's ability to govern and the structures that it needs to manage and mitigate the challenges that it's faced, such as emerging challenges like water scarcity and food insecurity and rapid population growth, therefore further driving fragility. So we have a circumstance in which fragility can itself become a driver of terrorism and then terrorism itself can become a driver of fragility, leading to a vicious cycle. Now, I'll wrap up my brief reflections there and hand back to Melissa and look forward to answering your questions and discussion. Thank you so much, Alistair. And, and both of our respondents um, really call attention to our community of practitioners and our audience here today um, and require us to, I think, really pay attention to what these trends mean for our programming and interventions and how we're looking to stem uh, some terrorism. We, for example, uh, Alistair, you, you rightly point out that um, uh, you know the sea bags are uh, an important actor that we have to consider in ensuring uh, peace um, and and a full stakeholder engagement. So, what does that mean for our DDR programs or, or prosecution rehabilitation reintegration programs? We really have to take um, those actors into account, take victims into account, victims of both terrorism and counterterrorism. Um, so I, I really appreciate that, and it really does call on us to, to uh, address our efforts and, and, and adapt them for these changes and trends, um, which I, I, I will, will um, use that as a segue uh, into our Q&A session, and again, invite individuals to submit their questions through the Q&A function, um, their written questions, or to raise their hands, and, and I see Mia Bloom um, will be joining us momentarily. Allow me first to ask one question that is being raised by Nicholas Sprang, um, Spang, sorry. And he asks, there is a concern in media that far-right extremists will enter the Ukraine to gain fighting experience. Historically, they have been divided whether to support Russia or the Ukraine. Is it possible to elaborate on that and on the phenomenon as such? And I, I'll pose that um, first to, to Steve. And within that context, I just want to note, you know, I, I think it's important that we recognize that this is a group of fighters that generally we have less research and data on what is driving those individuals. Um, and, and that's something that is a, a call to those researchers on, on the line here today to, to help us to, to dig into deeper. But Steve, I wonder if you could first address that question. Yeah, well, it's a great question. Yeah, now it's a great question. And I'd also be interested to hear Alice's response to this as well. So what we do know in the uh, Mombas and Dunst regions, a lot of the European far right people there went there for military training. So we, we do know that as a fact is happening. Now, we haven't seen that actually actualized in terms of attacks coming back to a, a, a Western Europe. So that hasn't actually eventuated as yet, but it's certainly a concern and a worry. And I think as Melissa quite rightly points out, there's not a lot of data on it. But what we can, yeah, what we can say is the Ukraine situation intensifies. We would expect to see an increase in terrorism, as I've already mentioned. And we can certainly see it in the Georgian war, 
and in the prior Ukrainian war. And this is a this is on a much, much bigger scale than either of those two were. So we're looking today like the estimates on a this is sort of two days old, so the stuff's moving fast, could be three days now, but that stage, the estimation of Russian troops which have been killed was somewhere between 2,000 and 7,000. Ukrainians were estimating 7,000. Uh, the Russians were saying 2,000. But in these kind of environments, you can people get the uh, used to violence and particularly brutal violence as a, just a normal part of life. So I think it's with the it moves further on, particularly if you end up with a strong a resistance movement to any puppet governments which put up by Russia, you're going to see a lot of terrorism increase. And that'd be more my worry than sort of the a people moving, a, a right-wing terrorist coming in, getting training and coming back to the West. But I'd be interested, Alistair. Oh, Alistair, you mentioned one thing on sort of the number of attacks not ascribed to a group. And yes, it was 52% in the year 2021, but that changes over time. So if we went back to 2007 and averaged it all the way through, because we did some crunching in the background after you said it, uh, it's 56%. But if you went back to 2019, uh, it was roughly uh, 41%. So it's a, it changes over time, but good question. Thanks for that, Steve. I might pick up your offline layer. I'm very curious of what it'd be like back in 2007 and where we've had a change over such a longer period and yeah. so on. Um, but to, to go back to um, the question on Ukraine, um, it, it's hard to give an answer on something which is in, in such early days of a conflict and such a fast moving conflict. But I think, unfortunately, um, as, as the research of the GTI shows that when you have um, violent conflicts, you often normally have increases in terrorism and exactly how the conflict um, plays out would often determine exactly this, um, the context which develops and, um, and the likelihood of whether we have terrorism in Ukraine and elsewhere spilling over for it. But I think um, one of the issues um, which is being flagged is about you know, the question of um, those people traveling um, to fight in, in the Ukraine and um, parallels drawn between foreign um, previous foreign fighters. I think it's, it's, too, it's too early to say, but so there's one thing we've learned in the past experiences is often unintended consequences of individuals traveling to fight in another conflict and i wouldn't want to predict what they what they would be in the future but i think we need to be aware that um, um that there may be other unintended consequences of what happens during the course of the conflict and when people come home from conflict or whether they move on to other conflicts afterwards Thank you both so much. Um, I'd like to invite Mia Bloom to, to take the floor to ask her question. Well, first of all, it's lovely to see everyone, especially old friends. And uh, thank you very much for uh, allowing me to ask the question. Unfortunately, while I was waiting, I had a second part too. So the question is for Steve. When you, when you presented your graphic uh, with the colors where orange was far left, it was very surprising to me. And so what I was hoping is maybe you could explain a little bit about the methodology of what specifically you were comparing, because I asked whether if you were looking at attacks against property as the same kind of attacks against individuals. And then Alistair's um, excellent commentary made me think of a second question, which is, you know, he talked about the coding of individual groups. But when we were looking at research that we did for the QAnon uh, book, what we found was a lot of intersectionality, that people could be more than one group at the same time. And so, Steve, I was curious, how are you handling that if somebody is both far right, Oath Keeper, and maybe QAnon, or someone is multiple groups, or even maybe they're members of different groups at different times, because we know from uh, some of the work that's being done that people switch. And you know, if you have someone who's kind of like a seeker, they might be right wing today and a jihadi in a week from now. Thank you so much. And again, congratulations on the report. Yeah, very, very good detailed questions. So the pretty orange, which was representative of the far right, sorry, the far left, but the kind of attacks which you'd find there, a lot of them were incendiary devices uh, left outside government buildings, a lot not aimed at harming people. So 
best example I can give you, let's say uh, the, uh, the new uh, uh, Irish Republican Army, new IRA. So they've got a, uh, they let a lot up in, the, uh, uh, in Northern Ireland and a lot of them it's just to sort of be, let people know they're there, uh, that they're a force to be reckoned with, uh, but without trying to actually aim at sort of the, uh, help, uh, the killing any individual. So that's more the kind, more the kind of attacks like the incendiary stuff. Now, in terms of the database we're using, there's five categories for a, a, a different groups. And so you've got far right, far left, you've got a politically a, a separatist, a religiously motivated, unspecified. Now, so QAnon isn't really a group, it's more of an ideology. And you're dead right, a lot of people in, the, in these circumstances, they'll follow one ideology one month, next month they may shift to another one. So in terms of sort of the way we're looking at it, we pick it up under those five categories. So I guess Q and Oath Seekers, those kind of things, that'd be seen as being far right. Uh, animal liberationist or activists, if you like, or a environment or, or radical environmentalists, that'd become that'd be more or less seen under the far left. But look, we're down here thinking more and more, and I think this is where you're thinking too, me. It's 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 not the, the, these far left, far right categorizations aren't necessarily all that helpful. There's a lot of the underlying motivations, as I mentioned earlier on, we believe are very, very similar. And so really we need to be looking back in society and looking at what are the factors which alienate people in the first place and then start looking back at them so that you get less disaffected people overall. Thank you. It's just when I saw your graphic, it, it reminded me of every talk that I've given in the last two years where I have people going, what about Antifa, Antifa? So clarifying that it's probably some continuity IRA or, or real IRA or something like that with a device versus what we traditionally think of a terrorist attack with casualties, that's very helpful. But don't be surprised if Fox News decides to put up your graphic and distort things. So that's what I was thinking of. And thank you again for the answer. Well, stuff gets distorted all the time. I don't, I don't know how many interviews I've done in the last uh, 48 hours. And you read some of them and you think, did I say that? <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the media. I was saying one thing in the report about um, left-wing attacks, which I, I found particularly interesting, and, and correct me if I get it wrong um, here, Steve, out of the left-wing attacks, 80% of them were incendiary devices or, or bombs or something, which I thought was an incredibly high number. And it's even though a lot of them um, have no intention to actually target people, um, they are still actually, you know, quite a, a serious attack. Yeah, no, that's right. And like, uh, the, I haven't got the figures off the top of my head. Uh, uh, yeah, I haven't got all the pics off the top of my head, but it, it seems to be a, a preferable, a, a preferable, a preferable device, and it's a lot of it's about bringing attention. Um, thank you very much for that, that back and forth. And I just wanted to bring in another element to the discussion. Um, and here it would be uh, probably first we'll turn to Farah for her her responses. Uh, but as indicated in the report, terrorist organizations have sought to capitalize on the secondary effects of the pandemic, such as isolation, increased online activity, and resentment towards government entities over restrictions. Although terrorist attacks have decreased globally, uh, should we be wary of an uptick in violent extremism in the near future, considering negative social and economic impacts of the pandemic, coupled with an increase in online engagement for, with extremist narratives? Great. Uh, thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, it's a good question, and I think I'll point to some of CTED's work that we've done in our uh, analytical paper series, which provides kind of insight into key short and medium and long-term impacts of COVID-19 pandemic on, on, on counterterrorism and countering violent extremism. Um, we published three papers that look into this a little um, from different angles and updating every six months. Um, and the last series was published in December of last year. So our analysis has been based mainly, again, on CTED's engagement with member states, 
um, and all of its partners, including uh, civil society actors and researchers and international and regional organizations around the globe. Um, well, what we're seeing at the moment are kind of predominantly the short and medium term impacts of the pandemic. In our report, we've kind of anticipated some of the future challenges um, that consider the longer term impacts. Um, and those include terrorist and violent extremist groups exploiting multiple issues to their benefit. So that would be, um, they would be able to recruit finance inside what have you um, through, through um, exploiting these multiple issues. And so these issues could be um, such that, sorry, my computer is acting up, <laughs> issues such as um, vaccine inequities, human rights abuses that happened during the pandemic, mis and disinformation on the pandemic it's, it itself, as well as mis and disinformation about um, the vaccine. So we, we're seeing that a lot of we're anticipating that a lot of the issues that happened during the pandemic will be used as a means of um, recruiting or inciting hatred. And this is across kind of the, the, the terrorism spectrum um, and looking at it kind of from a bird's eye view. Um, internally, I think we believe mostly that we'll start to see the longer term consequences in, the, in about four to five years and see how that really plays out. So. Um, we're keeping a close eye on, on issues around the globe and, and as they develop, um, we'll just keep updating our analysis and, and make that available to policymakers and, and, and uh, practitioners. Thanks so much. Steve or Alex, or anything you'd like to add to that? Oh, uh, certainly, a, one of the hypotheses we've got for the drop in the West on terrorism is related to lockdown. So if People have got their a, a restriction on movement and such. It's a lot harder to get out and do terrorist attack. You haven't got large gatherings of people, which you can then go and target, or not as easily anyway. Also, we think that sort of the, there's a lot more a, people, rather than focusing outward, are starting to focus inward. Uh, and so it's a lot more on their own concern and personal worry about their health. Now, obviously, 2022 will be the litmus test of the, whether what we've got is a real trend or it's something which COVID's induced. We did also notice that uh, violent demonstrations, they've been rising about 10% per annum each year for about the last decade. But 2021, there was a small drop. I forgot it now. I think it might have been 5 7%, but in that range. So there is something going on which is a, a, a cause through uh, COVID, but 2022 will be the litmus test of whether we, we keep the uh, numbers in the West low or whether it bounces back. Certainly when we're looking at the, uh, 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 when we're looking online, and certainly there's a, 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 a so people spending a lot more time, which we all know online, while they're locked down with COVID. And certainly there's a, we can see that there's a proliferation of different sites. And there's a lot of debate going on around how much a, 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 the social media a, a organizations a, should censor the, censor the information which goes up on their sites. But like this is a adapting environment. And so what you'll find is that a lot of the groups, what they'll do is they'll then sort of be put information online which just stays inside of where whatever the boundaries are for them to get taken down but then refer people over to other websites uh, uh, which where they'll have all the toxic and the uh, uh, really quite horrible information one of the other trends which has been happening in the last few years as well is with a lot of the violent gaming sites where you can go in and you can meet other people and sort of go off on hunts with them and do all sorts of things and so you get recruiters or a, uh, people from a, from a particular ideolo ideology in there sort of meet people. If they meet people who they think have got a, some common interest with them, then again, they'll refer them off to these websites which lie beyond the uh, constraints of the social media. So I guess that's a few of the trends we're seeing. Yeah, just uh, to add to that quickly, I mean, I think um, if I make a good point, I think one of the lasting implications will be the sort of um, um, the polarization and conspiracy theories which have happened and emerged during um, COVID and the impact they'll have going forward. But I think in terms of like the impact that COVID will have um, now sort of coming out of it, 
it's um it really depends what the long term impact of uh, of the pandemic uh, was be. I mean, oh, it's going to be very different. Depends on whether we end up going into a booming economy or end up going into a global recession as a result of the pandemic, or whether trust and government have been eroded because of the pandemic responses and so on. And I think these are the factors which will have um likely to have impact on on extremes and going forward. And um, <clears throat> I don't think um it's entirely clear how um the pandemic is going to play out in the longer term in terms of its lasting impacts. Yeah, I'd do you, yeah, just pick up on Alistair's comments because I think uh, the comments on the economy, quite often we don't take the uh, uh, how impactful the, uh, the economy is on sort of the average person. Uh, but certainly what we're seeing is rising inflation. Uh, we're watching uh, with the, uh, the Ukraine at the moment uh, uh, spikes in a whole range of different uh, 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 commodities. So, for example, if we're looking at the Russian economy, they produce 10% of the oil in the world. And we've seen the uh, 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 oil prices, uh, 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 you know, the futures go up dramatically in the last three or four days. And so you're hearing some experts saying that oil could be up to $150 a barrel. I don't think it'll get there, but either way, that's uh, it's incredibly inflationary. 15% of the world's gas uh, comes out of the Ukraine. Half of that goes to Europe, okay? Half of it goes to Europe. So Europe, although they've stopped the prong to gas the uh, pipeline, they're still getting their gas from Russia via other pipelines, which ironically enough run through the Ukraine. Uh, the uh, palladium, I think it's about 27% of the world's uh, supply of palladium that's used in a lot of our high tech gadgets uh, come from out of Russia. And on the wheat, it's about 25% of the world's wheat or 20% of the world's wheat exports, 20 to 25% of the world's wheat exports come out of the combination of Russia and the Ukraine. We've seen the price of the wheat uh, on the futures exchange has uh, increased dramatically in the last three days. And so as we're looking forward, looking forward, uh, we've been come off a, a lot, very, very low uh, a interest rates. Uh, most governments have got an awful lot of debt. Uh, uh, so the global debt uh, in the developed economies is 250% of GDP. So that takes in, that, that, that's gross debt, not net, but that takes into account all government debt, business debt, and individual debt. So these are truly a, a, a exceptional amounts. And so a very gradual raise in inflation is probably not bad because that erodes the debt away. But very quick increase in inflation is to be disastrous on the economy. And I'm with it, Alistair that any uh, uh, hits on the economy will have spillback effects with alienation, uh, disenchantment with the system. The other thing I'd say on that too, if you, the Economist Intelligence Unit put out a, uh, you know, their democracy report about a month ago, and that showed in most of the Western democracies, democracies on the decline yet again in another year. And these things come back and affect alienation. I think that's a really important dynamic for us to consider and, and, and where, um, how liberal and illiberal governments will uh, work together or not in the future. Um, and we can see sort of it is likely that, that Russia's isolation from the rest of the world could push it closer to countries such as Mali, which is also being ostracized um, in Africa. So really, really interesting dynamics there. Um, uh, we, I would like to hand the floor over to Haruna Abdullahi um, to, to pose his question to the panel. Haruna, the floor is yours. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for this important meeting. And thank you for Steve and all the, the participants of this, uh, of this call. So I have uh, two concerns. The first is, uh, as you know, since that uh, uh, Abu Walid was killed in, uh, in the Sahel, there is a problem of challenge of leadership between the different terrorist groups. So for now, it is like quite difficult to say who is the leader of these different terrorist groups in, in the Sahel zone. So, and it is uh, leading to a, a, a banditry 
in, in the area that is taking place and uh, kidnapping that is growing in the Sahel. So I think for me is all these things is because there is a problem of who is leading who in this, in this Sahel zone. So according to your experience, Steve, how can you, uh, how do you see the future of these terrorist groups without uh, concrete leaders in, in the Sahel? And how this kind of situation can harm, because now it is very difficult for the population because they are, they are in the communities and they are uh, perpetrating kidnapping and uh, kind of banditries. As you know, Sahel is a vast space where the government having, doesn't have any control of the space. And you know, there is all kind of trafficking of drug, of um, migration. So all the combination of what can be uh, a, a good place for a terrorist to emerge. So uh, if you can just help me to understand better how uh, those groups can, the future of those groups without leaders. And my second question is that, uh, you know that uh, there is, uh, uh, how we call it, um, uh, anti-France military uh, propaganda or uh, people, we don't like France to be in this space. And it starts in Mali, it is in Burkina, uh, and even in Yemen people, uh, in Niger people, uh, are against the foreign force um, from France. And now that uh, there is the war in, uh, in uh, Ukraine, and that uh, the, the, those foreign force that are uh, acting in Niger, maybe the, uh, in the Sahel, maybe uh, they will concentrate more you know, on the Ukraine side. So do you think that can give an opportunity to those terrorist groups to say, okay, now the, the, uh, the, 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 those Europeans or France or these foreign forces are now concentrating their efforts in, Euro, in, uh, in Ukraine, let's organize to, to start um, uh, to control the Sahel. So I don't know uh, if you Thank can you. help me understand that. Thank, Thank you for you. that. Thank you for that question, um, Haruna. And if I can, just mindful of the time, I'd like to invite Steve um, to respond, but also we'll just invite each of our three speakers to share some final remarks before we close up. Right. Well, uh, your comments on banditry, uh, obviously, you know, you've got your mind across the situation. A lot of what you see is criminal groups now who are taking on the, uh, the colours of the Islamic group because they think that is a better uh, uh, control. Certainly, uh, Abdul Wahal, the assassination of him, so for people who don't know, that was the leader of the Boko Haram. That caused them to split. That's part of the reason that the Islamic State in West Africa has been, uh, uh, been, been growing in influence and strength. And there was also a split between Boko Haram as well, between those that wanted to align closer with ISIS and become more radical than what they were and those that wanted to stay uh, more pure to what the old Boko Haram, Haram was. So certainly those splits there have created splinter groups. What we do find, and I can't predict the future for you, Haruna, but what we do find is the more you get the splinter groups, the more they'll start to fight with between themselves over territory, which increases the terrorism yet again. And I think that's part of what's going in Africa. If you quietly, quite rightly point out the governments are weak, you see if we look at it, there's been eight coups in the Sahel in the last 15 months, of which five were successful, including two in Mali. 
Now, if we come back and we start to look at French engagement, obviously, yes, you've mentioned they've had the strong force, and I think it's about 7,000 people in Mali, but they're not all that popular uh, because of their colonial heritage. And so this stage now, uh, they are pulling out of Mali. We do have the Wagner Group, which is a, a Russian a paramilitary group. They're now active in the Sahel as well. And we have noticed that China now has appointed a peace ambassador too, so they're getting interested as well. And this is, I don't think this is long runs of good for the Sahel. We're now starting to see a whole lot of geopolitical groups which are competing in other areas now getting involved in the Sahel, but we need to see where that goes. Now, I think in terms of wars in Africa uh, being a copycat of from the war in Ukraine, I think the issue with the Ukraine, and I think this is, and I've been saying this again and again as I've been speaking to the press and uh, speaking at other launch events like this, is that the uh, Ukraine uh, means that the, the West can't lose sight on what's happening in the Sahel, can't lose sight because it is in my centre, that's the epicentre of terrorism now, and we really need to focus to work out how to bring it under control. But one of the things the IEP is doing, which is just a very small thing at the moment, we're doing training in a, 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 a Nigeria. We're in the process of training a thousand IEP ambassadors. Uh, uh, and so it's a, that, that's a large number, large number, but that's one of the things we're doing there. So there's a, there's a need to really sort of, I think, for the counterinsurgency, uh, for some more counterinsurgency operations in the Sahel to keep up and to be funded by the West, and the West needs to be engaged and not get 100% lost in the Ukraine. Thank you so much. Farah, could I invite you for some final reflections? Sure. Um, I think one of uh, the encouraging things about the GTI is that we're seeing another year of uh, down of a decrease in um, terrorism incidents. Um, but I think with that in mind, also we we are aware that um, groups such as um, ISIL are becoming more decentralized, that their um, supporters are emerging and expanding in different battlefields in the West and the East and Southern and Central Africa, and that they're seeking to exploit recent developments in Afghanistan. Um, considering also the new developments that are happening around the world, um, it will be interesting to see how they further develop or, um, their tactics. Um, and what that might mean for future counterterrorism uh, measures. Um, that also coupled with the um, impacts of the pandemic and the longer term impacts of the pandemic, um, I think there's a lot to um, anticipate for the years to come. We're always trying to be positive, but at the same time, I think um, a little realism is needed um, to ground ourselves in, in that the, the, our fight against terrorism is not yet over and is um, possibly quite far from it, but that there are lots of factors that should keep us motivated to keep keep the, the fight going. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Alistair. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, just some vague remarks on it. I think um, there's lots of fascinating data that comes out of GTI and there's some, some good news and some bad news in terms of terrorism. I think um, overall sort of highlights um, the, um, the transnational aspects of it and the complexity of it. And whereas we may have um, improvements in some regions often um, corresponds with um, um, situations getting worse in other regions. But also I think um, we need to um, understand and focus on the context in which um, terrorism happens to be able to tailor our responses to it. And that context is often quite different in different countries, but also just to understand that this is a complex problem and take a wide look over different factors in it and look at extremism within, extremism terrorism within the sort of wider ecosystem of the different actors taking place. But also just um, finally as a point I made about um, looking at the rise of terrorism in the Sahel and the role of fragility and, um, it, and the impact that um, the different stresses are going to have on that reason going forward and to watch out how that will have, um, impact on terrorism going forward in the next few years and for us to be able to think through how to respond in terms of counterterrorism policy but also in terms of development policy 
to be able to alleviate the factors which um, can often um, lead to driving of terrorism. Thank you all so much. And absolutely, I think the GTI does a wonderful job of drawing attention to these global trends, but also providing that country level analysis. And, and at the Global Center, we're very committed to having this a sort of tailored and context specific response as we can, but we have to be mindful of these larger trends. Um, on behalf of the organizers of today's uh, roundtable event, I just want to thank you all to our speakers. Thank you for um, your rich comments and, and reflections and to those that have asked the questions and, and to all of you who attended, we wish you all the best.